Hey guys, it's Holly Baxter here and I'm with Dr. Lane Norton and today we're going to be talking about the recent film, The Game Changers. Now, Game Changers is a film that was produced by James Cameron and has been promoted by Arnold Schwarzenegger, so it's getting a lot of attention. Now, the premise of the film is that James Wilkes, a UFC fighter, gets injured and during his recovery, he ends up doing a lot of research about nutrition and finds this elite group of athletes, medical professionals, and scientists who are vegans. And he kind of learns that everything he knew about protein was a lie. So what I think Lane and I were hoping to see with this film was the portrayal of vegan athletes uh, achieving an elite level in their chosen sport. But instead, uh, what the film does is uh, create a lot of false dichotomies. Uh, there's a lot of cherry picking of data. A lot of logical fallacies. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, you and I would never argue that someone can be vegan and become an elite level athlete. Yeah, and I think we would both agree that the inclusion of a diet that is rich in you know, plant-based materials um, is is a great thing, absolutely. Yeah. We want to make it clear that we uh, don't have anything against the veganism, no. um, you know, particularly for ethical reasons. That's not for us to judge. With that said, we're not here to judge the claims made on ethics or anything like that. We're going to simply take the claims that were made about various scientific data and break those down uh, based on what the data actually says. So the film starts off uh, with James talking about his injury and talking about really digging into the research. Now, first of all, he said he spent a thousand hours looking through research articles. He should have gone and done a PhD because that's, that's probably as much or more time than you spend uh, in a PhD going through research articles. So if he really did that, kudos, uh, I'm a little bit skeptical. He claims that he came across this uh, study that determined that gladiators were vegan. Now, what they cite in the video is actually not a study, it's a narrative article. Uh, I went and got the study that they were referring to in the article and actually looked at the data. Now, what the data showed was this particular burial site of gladiators, that there was a high ratio of strontium to calcium in their bones, which suggests that they ate a lot of plants. And in fact, the historical record seems to support that. Uh, there was something called a gladiator mash, which they ate um, in order to help them heal. It does seem that gladiators from that particular area ate a lot of plant-based material. Now that said, they take that and jump all the way to gladiators were vegan and this was because it was the best thing in the world for the performance. There are some major problems with that. First off, gladiators from other sites like Thebes uh, actually had high levels of sulfur suggesting they ate a lot of seafood and fish. It's more about where they were located and what foods they had access to. And if you look at ancient civilizations, that's how most people ate. They ate what they had access to. It wasn't necessarily, oh, I want this to be the best performing thing I can possibly have. And that brings me to another fact. Gladiators were performing to stay alive. Um, it wasn't necessarily based on the best athletic performance in the world. In fact, I'm gonna read a quote from one of the researchers from the actual research paper. This is from Carl Groschmidt, who is the collaborator of Fabian Kahn's, who Kahn's is uh, portrayed in the film. Uh, they did interview Carl, which uh, I think I know why. <laughs> so Groschmidt said, the vegetarian diet had nothing to do with poverty or animal rights. Gladiators, it seems, were fat. Consuming a lot of simple carbohydrates, such as barley and legumes, like beans, was designed for survival in the arena. Packing in the carbs also packed on the pounds. Gladiators needed subcutaneous fat because a fat cushion protects you from cut wounds, shields nerves, and blood vessels in a fight. He also went on to say that having a layer of fat meant somebody could get wounded and bleed, but not die, and they could last longer in the arena. So this isn't really what you would want for optimal performance in most sports these days. So kind of drawing the conclusion that since gladiators ate a mostly plant-based diet, oh, by the way, the evidence is they still ate some animal products, just not a lot. It's a complete, it's a complete misrepresentation of the data. So then they kind of switch gears and they talk about how we were told for a long time that protein is fuel for exercise. And they kind of create this idea that everyone thinks protein is fuel. 
They next interview a gentleman by the name of Scott Jurek, and he's an ultra marathon runner. So they try to create the fallacy that protein is fuel for this particular sport. Now, this type of activity is an ultra endurance event. And the primary fuel source that we want to use for that type of exercise is carbohydrate and perhaps some, some fats as well, depending on the duration of that, that activity. So for them to try and make us believe that protein is the fuel source for this type of event is immediately a big no-no. I don't think anybody in the scientific community believes that protein is a major fuel for endurance exercise. On the other hand, though, if you are a competitive bodybuilder or an athlete that requires you know, a significant amount of lean body mass... Well, then it would be very important to have a diet that is, you know, rich in protein as well. But yeah. for, for this particular sport, it, it isn't something that is providing him with energy for those types of races. Right. Now, protein can be useful for recovery for uh, endurance athletes. In fact, Absolutely. there's uh, a few studies out there that shows that probably at minimum, the protein requirements for like elite endurance athletes, and we're talking marathoners, ultra marathoners, are at minimum about 1.4 grams per kilo mm -hmm. and up to 1.8 grams per kilo. There was a recent survey of vegans done, thousands of people, and they showed that the average vegan consumed about 83 grams of protein per day. And they actually say in the video, this is 50% more than they need. Now, when they use the term need, they're talking about uh, preventing nitrogen imbalance. Yeah, so, or deficiency of protein. <laughs> correct, yeah. So deficiency is a lot different than what's optimal. optimal yeah. Right. <laughs> Now, people who were non-vegans consumed about 113 grams of protein in this study. Now, what's funny is both of those amounts for a 75 kilogram endurance athlete would fall well shy of their optimal protein intakes. So, you know, at, at 83 grams of protein per day, it's like 1.1 grams per kilo of body weight for a 75 kilogram uh, endurance athlete. So they would need to get way more protein to get to the optimal ratio to prevent nitrogen losses and losses in lean body mass, which, listen, for endurance exercise, lean body mass isn't the most important thing, but you still need to have some. But also saying that protein is not any source of fuel is also a little bit misleading. So in the video, Scott Loomis actually says that when you replace uh, carbohydrate with protein, you're depleting your muscle of glycogen. And that's not actually true. There is a mechanism called gluconeogenesis that actually enables protein to be converted to carbohydrate for energy. So again, another uh, false claim. Yeah, and actually there's some research showing that if you give carbohydrate alone or protein plus carbohydrate, in every single study, protein plus carbohydrate is at least as good as carbohydrate alone at restoring muscle glycogen. And in, in one or two studies, it's actually been shown to be superior. Now, there was a study done where they looked at doing an endurance event and then the next day doing another endurance event. And after the first event, they gave either carbohydrate alone post-workout or they gave protein plus carbohydrate. The calories were equal. And what they found was performance was actually better the subsequent day, the subsequent day with protein plus carbohydrate. So this idea that you can't have protein if you're an endurance athlete or you don't need protein is a complete fallacy. So this is why experts recommend a diet that is adequate in protein, high in carbohydrate and low in fats for endurance athletes. They then go on to show a series of several athletes who have um, reached a high level in their sport by being vegans. Now, the big one they hit on is Nate Diaz versus Conor McGregor fight, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So... They show Nate Diaz, who's a vegan, uh, beating Conor McGregor in a fight. And they kind of say, well, it's because Conor had too many steaks before his fight. I mean, that, that, that's, that's literally the way they portray it. Yeah. What they don't talk about is their training, their endurance differences. Yeah, their Nate, years of experience yeah. and consistency. <laughs> and the fact that I watch MMA, Nate is a bad matchup for Conor McGregor. Well, Nate's a bad matchup for a lot of people. But um, Conor McGregor is a stand-up fighter. Nate is a really good stand-up fighter as well, has a great chin, and he's an expert in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So it's not surprising that Nate choked him out. Also, nobody mentions the fact that Connor went up two weight classes to fight Nate, and Nate has a crazy gas tank. Like, he's excellent in endurance. Now, what that shows is that veganism certainly didn't inhibit Nate, but 
they go through cherry picking all these different athletes. And what I want you to remember is if you look for something, usually you can find it. If you look for something to confirm your bias, typically you can find it. So keep in mind, these were the best athletes they could find who were vegan. They're not going to put the guy who's a vegan who never even makes his high school team on the documentary, right? So trying to draw the link that veganism is the cause of them being elite without talking about genetics, their training, all the other aspects of their diet. It's foolish. And I mean, let's just go to Usain Bolt. Okay, if we want to cherry pick somebody. Yeah, isn't this the guy that said that he would eat like a thousand chicken nuggets in the lead up to the Olympics? Yeah, so they said the week of the Olympics, they estimate he ate over 100 chicken nuggets per day. Oh Funny how he wasn't in the documentary, right? So another fallacy that this film actually talks about is the fact that plant protein is better or superior than animal protein. Now, Lane, you did your PhD thesis in this, so I'm going to let you take this one because this is right <laughs> up your wheelhouse. <laughs> um, so they kind of talk about how, well, animals get their protein from plants. So they're just really an intermediate. Why don't we just eat the plants? Well, the animals that eat plants, let's take, for example, a cow. Mm -hmm. A cow is what's called a ruminant. It actually has four stomachs. Mm -hmm. It is made to extract amino acids from plant material. We, our digestive tract... A little different. <laughs> we, they also have very specific bacterial flora that help them extract amino acids. If we ate grass, we ain't getting those amino acids. So plant protein, the problem with some plant proteins is they have much less bioavailability, meaning uh, they don't get fully absorbed from the intestinal tract. Whereas animal protein has a much higher bioavailability. The other thing is their amino acid ratios. Correct. So they're quite or substantially different to that of animals. Yeah. So typically you have two different kinds of amino acids. You have essential amino acids, which your body cannot make. You have to get from food. And you have non-essential amino acids, which your body can make. Plants are much higher in non-essential amino acids compared to animal protein. Whereas animal protein is much higher in essential amino acids. Uh, in particular, certain plant proteins are really deficient in lysine, tryptophan, methionine, um, and none of them are really deficient in leucine, but leucine is the amino acid responsible for stimulating muscle protein synthesis mm. and creating an anabolic environment in muscle. And plant proteins typically have very low levels of, of leucine. So. Yeah, compared to animal proteins, they typically are lower. There are some plant proteins that have a decent level of leucine, like rice and pea, corn. but then they yeah, corn, but they also are frank deficient in other amino acids. Now, if you're a vegan, you can get a complete spectrum of amino acids if you're consuming a lot of different plant protein sources, but you gotta be pretty careful and pretty diligent about what proteins you're eating and in what proportions. The other thing is you can get sufficient essential amino acids through a vegan diet. However, you've typically gotta consume more total protein because of the uh, differences in essential amino acid content, especially leucine. So, I guess the, and the implications of that are that you end up having to consume a greater, far greater amount of calories from carbohydrates um, because of the plant-based source. Right. So when you look at something like leucine, we actually did an experiment where we compared wheat protein to whey protein, and we found that 10% of calories from protein, whey was very superior to wheat. At 20%, whey was still superior, but at 30% of the total calories from diet, they were very similar. Mm -hmm. So what that says is if you get a vegan source of protein high enough, it can be enough to maximize muscle protein synthesis, but you need more total protein because the quality isn't as high. Now remember, vegans on average consume much less protein than non-vegans. So if you're going to be vegan, you can do that, but you have to be very careful about how much protein you're consuming and where you're getting it from. So to add to that, they also interviewed a strong man and he actually broke the world record carry for the heaviest carry. Mm -hmm. And what they didn't show was his meal plan. Now, his meal plan included a bunch of different amino acids, essential amino acids and branch chain amino acids. As supplements. As supplements. Yeah, and he also was getting like four protein shakes a day. Exactly. So it's not like he was just having a bunch of uh, like whole food plant sources of protein, he was having to supplement. Yeah. So they didn't talk about this. And ironically, you know, they cherry picked this vegan athlete and he carried uh, 1,223 pounds. Very impressive. But they also neglected to mention that Hat Thor Bjornsson and Brian Shaw, both who eat copious amounts of meat, 
uh, carried 1,565 pounds in 2017. For some reason, they didn't mention that the meat eaters ended up carrying 300 pounds more. Mm. And the extra drug use. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I mean, now that can be said for the, for the meat eaters as well, but the strongman is not a tested division. And that's one of the other things is Patrick claims that he put on 25 kilos after he went vegan. But it wouldn't surprise me based on his calorie intake. Perhaps he was using performance enhancers. We don't know. We, we can't say for sure. But certainly that's a very popular thing in that, in that sport. But also the fact that he was taking in so many protein shakes and supplements. So the next thing that blew my mind, <laughs> and I am surprised that they even let this make it into the film, to be honest. And that is the comment about peanut butter sandwiches having the same amount of protein as three ounces of steak or three eggs. Now... Let's do a little bit of math here, shall we? <laughs> I can tell the dietitian's getting excited about this. <laughs> so, okay, let's we'll we'll take the low end of this and we'll say that for three eggs, it contains or they contain 18 grams of protein. Yep. So you could actually have a little bit more depending on the size of the egg. Yeah. Are large eggs. And most most steaks are more like 21 or 22 grams of protein. And if it's a top sirloin that's lean, it's more like 26 grams of protein. Right. But we'll just say 18 just to give the benefit of the doubt. Okay. So if we look now at peanut butter, one serving of peanut butter, a 32 gram serving of peanut butter has uh, around eight grams of protein. Um, so you would have to have a significant amount more to match that of the steak and the eggs, but it also has 16 grams of fat and around six grams of carbohydrate as well. So if we do the math, you would have to have about 1.25 servings of the peanut butter. Right. If you add, say, two slices of bread to that, each slice of bread has around a gram of protein. Uh, so actually like three or four grams of protein. Oh, sorry, three or four grams of protein, 14 grams of carbohydrates per slice, and one gram of fat. Now, let's times that by two. That peanut butter sandwich has around 412 calories. Yeah, at least. At, at least, least. To match that of the three eggs and the uh, three ounces steak, which has about half the amount of calories. So three eggs would have 200 calories and uh, three ounces of even like one of the fattiest cuts of steak would have 228 calories. Now, if you're talking about a really lean cut of steak, like a top sirloin, which isn't even the leanest cut, mm -hmm. um, you were talking about packed with 26 grams of protein yeah, and only, only 150 grams of, uh, <laughs> you're talking about 26 grams of protein and only 150 calories. Now, sure, you can get as much protein for peanut butter, but you're also going to get it with a lot more calories. And keep in mind, the quality of the mm -hmm. protein is going to be lower. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if you want the same anabolic response, you actually need to consume even more of it. So, hey, if you're somebody who has a really fast metabolism and you're doing a lot of endurance exercise, maybe you can get away with that many calories for the amount of protein you're getting. But for most of us, um, we would rather have a little bit more protein per calorie. So then they kind of flash back to more anecdote. And this is one of the ones where I like screamed at the TV. Um, <laughs> they, they highlighted Bryant Jennings and they're like, he's a vegan boxer who went uh, the, the distance in a fight with Vladimir Klitschko, one of the greatest fighters of all time. <laughs> who eats meat? meat? <laughs> who eats meat? Well, uh, uh, gee, I wonder why they didn't touch on that. I mean, that again... That is an example of cherry picking to show what you want to show. If you're a true documentary, you don't just show one side. You show both, both sides, sides and then you let people make a decision. So that's why we refer to this as a film and not a documentary. So the film then progresses into... A, the first burrito experiment. A, a burrito experiment. So they're looking at the experiment. Miami Dolphins and Dr. Robert, Robert Vogel, who is a Sells vegan. vegan products. Sells vegan products. And he basically wants to look at some blood samples of all of the athletes after the consumption of some different types of burritos. And this is a classic example of a bait and switch. Mm. So he talks a lot about endothelial function and fat clogs your arteries and constricts your blood vessels and, th and that sort of thing. And so they feed three different burritos to three different players. Um, one is a vegan burrito. Mm -hmm. One is, I think, has... Um, steak. Steak and the other has chicken. Yep. Um, and then they look at their blood afterwards. Now, important to note, they don't actually measure endothelial function. They just show the serum. Yeah. So basically they take the blood and they spin it, so they spin it down. Centrifuge, and, yeah. Yeah, centrifuge it and then show it. And what do they show? So they're looking at the serum of the athlete's blood and with the vegan burrito, uh, it's nice and clear. And with the uh, 
meat-eating burrito, it's a little cloudy. This is what's called digestion of fats. So, Kyla microns. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the reason blood looks cloudy is because it has more fats in it. It's not because they ate animal sources of protein. It's because the sources of protein they chose were, were very fat. fatty. Yeah. Now, they said they chose chicken, but they didn't show the macros on the burrito. They didn't show how much fat was in there. But they claimed that, oh, well, there was avocado in the vegan burrito, and still it ended up cloudy. Well, they didn't show us what the calories were, and they didn't show us what the fats were. And this was also sponsored by the Haas Avocado Board, which they also neglected to mention. Mm. So... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's just another example of cherry picking and a bait and switch. Because again, they talked a lot about endothelial function, which by the way, they can measure, but they chose not to. So the way that we actually metabolize and process fats is that after digestion, those fats are broken down and they're repackaged into what we know as chylomicrons. And that is what actually gives the serum that cloudy, cloudy color. So basically the meal that is highest in fats is actually going to show through as having the most, you know, cloudy appearance. And naturally, the the steak burrito is probably the highest in fat. So that's we're just looking at packaged chylomicrons here. It's it's just ridiculous. Now, we actually looked at studies that measured endothelial function <laughs> with lean sources of animal protein. So we're talking about dairy, fish, chicken. They showed they showed no reduction in endothelial function. In fact, they even had one showing that when they gave lean beef, that systolic blood pressure decreased and endothelial function improved. So again, they didn't really talk about that. They just made it out. And they do this throughout the film. They talk about animal sources of protein, but what's actually measured is an extremely high fat source of protein. When you look at the experiments that use lean sources of protein, you don't see the same results. Now, now Holly, let's talk about the beetroot juice. Oh my gosh, I nearly died when I saw this. Classic example of them actually not reading the study. Yeah, did you read it? They make claims that beetroot juice consumption uh, increases your bench press by 19%. That's a 19% 19 increase in your strength. So it's too bad I didn't have beetroot juice before my bench press at uh, Raw Nationals. It would have taken me from a piddly 386 oh, pound bench to a 459 pound bench. <laughs> I would have been sixth in bench press and fifth overall. Uh, alas, I did not have my trusty beetroot juice. Mm. So if you actually read the study, which we did, they weren't talking about absolute strength. They had people take 60% of a one rep maximum, do three sets, and they looked at how many repetitions they could get. What they found was the group that had the beetroot juice could get 19% more reps over the course of that three sets. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, that suggests that it could be helpful yeah, for, for high repetition work. Yeah, perhaps um, some anti-fatigue kind of yeah, properties. Yeah. But it's not going to make you stronger. And so, again, it's this classic misportrayal of the actual research where they show you a scientific study, make a claim that's kind of, sort of what the researchers say, now, I don't know if they purposely misrepresented it or it's just ignorance in the fact that they didn't actually read the experiment. I don't think they have any scientists actually working on this film. Well, they, they claim they did, but um, <laughs> yeah, some of the stuff is suspect. So the film then goes on to look at inflammation. Now, there's uh, quite a lot of um, epidemiological studies that look at low-grade uh, inflammation uh, contributing to things like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and various other chronic disease states. If you look at epidemiological research, um, what it's really good at doing is they look at a population, they look at what their habits are, and they try to relate those habits to different disease outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now, they yeah. specifically talk about protein yeah. being the cause of this. So if you look at meat eaters, they tend to have higher levels of inflammation. And the film uses this to kind of say, well, see, meat products cause inflammation. The problem with trying to draw causation from epidemiology is causation does not always equal correlation. There are some insane things that correlate with each other. Like for example, uh, did you know that the uh, age of Miss America and deaths by vapor, hot steam, and hot objects are very tightly correlated, way more tightly correlated than uh, meat and inflammation. Now, I don't think the age of Miss America is causing people to get murdered by steam, but I could be wrong. Um, so that's why epidemiology is useful to help us ask questions. Yeah, I think they guide future studies, but these are studies that we would then carry out more rigorous and quantitative type studies that provide us with a direct cause and effect. If you look at the effects of fatty meat intake 
and inflammation, you do see an increase in inflammation when you give more fat from meat. Now, that being said, they don't usually control calories in this experiment. Mm. In the experiments where they control calories and even giving beef, like lean beef and good sized portions of lean beef, they actually see no difference in inflammation. One study in particular looked at a high protein diet from animal proteins or a high protein diet from vegan proteins and looked at uh, inflammation over the course of a weight loss period. So both groups were consuming the same calories, same macros, everything. What they found was both groups decreased inflammation equally. That suggests that it's not the animal source of protein as much as it is extra calories. So excessive calorie intake is what causes us to gain weight. And if, again, looking at a survey of vegans versus non-vegans, vegans consume on average 600 calories less per day than the average uh, omnivore. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not surprising that they wouldn't have high levels of inflammation because they're controlling their calories more than omnivores are. Now we want to get really picky. Let's talk about the vegan cheese comparison to yeah. regular cheese. Yeah, so there's a part in the video where one of the wives of one of the NFL players is cooking a big meal, right? And it's got, they've got vegan chicken wings, vegan mac and cheese. Vegan burgers, cheesecakes. Vegan peanut butter cheesecake. And these foods are kind of shown as being like healthy because, because they're, they're vegan. vegan. <laughs> there was actually a study done looking at regular cheese versus vegan cheese and its effects on inflammatory markers. And they actually show that the vegan cheese, probably because of the processing and maybe the saturated fat breakdown, had a worse effect on CRP, a marker of inflammation, than the regular animal cheese. Just because something is vegan doesn't inherently make it healthy, especially when it's heavily processed and calorically dense. So Lane, I know this next thing uh, really got under your skin, and it's a scene where uh, they're doing battle ropes. Do you, want to, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so James is talking about his process of recovery from his injury and how he went in after becoming vegan and, you know, you get your name on the wall after 10 minutes at his gym if you go on the battle ropes for 10 minutes. And how many, how many minutes did uh, He went for over an hour and felt like he could have gone for longer. <laughs> Oddly, he wasn't really even sweating, um, but this is obviously staged for the video. Mm -hmm. So what they don't tell you is James's injury was back in 2011 and he's been vegan ever since. So there's no record of this actual, uh, this actual gym session. So we're kind of taking James' words for it. Now, if the rest of the film had been very honest about the research and portrayed both sides of the story, I'd be much more inclined to believe what James said about the battle robes. But even if it is true, it's just one situation. You can find incidences of people who, even like, for example, Zach Bitter. He's one of the best... Uh, elite endurance athletes in the world and he actually uses a low-carb diet mm -hmm. so if I want to find what will fit my bias I can find it if I look for it so next they really try to scare you and talking about animal protein and cardiovascular disease and cancer and they flash a bunch of studies up on the screen most of these studies again are epidemiology which we've already established correlation is not causation so what they don't talk about is that vegans have what's called a health-seeking behavior profile can you explain to our viewers what that means so basically, vegans tend to seek out healthier behaviors. Generally, their lifestyles are a little bit more low risk. Um, they look to, they're probably more active, they don't smoke. Um, they generally want to pursue matters of health. Yeah, they eat less calories, as we already talked about. Yeah, so if we compare this to uh, a meat eater, um, generally, these people tend to be a little bit more risk-taking and they're less focused on overall health outcomes. There's actually a couple of studies, because if you look at the research of meat eaters versus non-meat eaters, there is kind of a consistent epidemiological connection between animal protein, Red meat cancer, eaters. and cardiovascular disease. But again, it's hard to pick out all these confounding variables. There was a really elegant study that looked at all-cause mortality in health-seeking vegetarians versus health-seeking omnivores, right? So what they did was they went to health stores to recruit these people and divide them up into vegetarian and non-vegetarian category. What they found was there was absolutely no difference in all-cause mortality between the two groups. This was over 11,000 people. Mm -hmm. Again, if animal products had such a profound impact on cancer and cardiovascular disease, we would expect to see more all-cause mortality in the group consuming animal products. There was also a study done in Australia, 243 
thousand people mm -hmm. looking at all cause mortality between vegetarians and non vegetarians and showed no difference. So again, you can show these correlations between meat and cardiovascular disease and cancer, but what they also don't tell you about is they really kind of tweak with the statistics. So the actual risk increase from eating meat is 1%. So if you have an absolute risk of 5% normally, if you eat meat over the course of your life, your risk goes up to 6%. But they don't call it a 1% increase. They call it a 20% relative increase because six minus five divided by five is 20%. And there was a recent huge meta-analysis of kind of other meta-analyses looking at the association between meat and cancer incidence and mortality. And the conclusion at the end of that study was, there does, <laughs> yeah, there does seem to be a very small association, but the evidence is extremely weak. The only, the, the studies that show a tighter correlation are the studies that are not controlled as well. Mm -hmm. Or they're epidemiological studies, so right. they're just looking at observations. The best, most tightly controlled studies show very little to no association with meat and cancer or cardiovascular disease. And again, if there was this causational effect, we would expect to see lean animal products have the same effect on cardiovascular disease markers as, uh, as even fatty animal products, but it doesn't. In fact, several studies with the Mediterranean diet, which is like a 30% protein, yeah, moderate carb, moderate fat, uh, but very low in saturated fat, they actually show that it reverses a lot of the cardiovascular risk factors. Yeah, and they actually claim in the video as well that the vegan diet is the only diet that is able to actually reverse some of these cardiovascular uh, conditions. So, Yeah, funny they didn't talk about the Mediterranean diet in the video. Yeah, again, and another example of cherry picking. So they then try to kind of... Uh, convince you that a vegan diet is better for muscle building because gorillas are jacked, mm -hmm. right? And cows have more muscle than humans do. Um, but gorillas eat seasonally. Mm -hmm. And actually their normal diet is about 19% protein. Which yeah, is still that's 5% more than vegans, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now, because they're eating seasonally, um, then when fruits and other sweet things are not available, they actually end up increasing their protein intake to about 30%. Yeah. So... They do eat protein, and keep in mind, their digestive systems are very different to ours, and they're far better able to extract a lot of those you know, essential uh, amino acids and things from plants than what we would be. Exactly. So, okay, men, this one's for you. Eating meat will make your dick go soft. I'll take five vegan burritos, please. I nearly died when they started doing this test. Like, yeah, so they repeated the burrito experiment. And they showed the dudes that ate the vegan burrito had harder erections and all this kind of stuff. And they, they try to relate it to testosterone. Mm -hmm. So they say that vegans actually have higher testosterone. So I looked up this study. Um, that's not what the study said. Mm -mm. They did not have significantly higher testosterone. And actually, they had higher levels of sex hormone binding globulin, which binds testosterone and renders it inert, meaning they have less free testosterone to actually build muscle. So next they interview a couple of bodybuilders or men's physique athletes and these guys are vegans, which is fine. Now, we're not saying that you can't be an exceptional athlete and compete in some of these you know, physique building competitions as a vegan. But what we are saying is that due to the lower quality of proteins that come from plants, it is much more challenging to build a diet that is going to get you to uh, an optimal uh, outcome. Yeah, so they talk about these guys with no acknowledgement of genetics, mm. training history, their overall diet. They just mentioned that they're vegan. Again, cherry picking, right? Yeah. Confirmation bias. What about the thousands of athletes? Tens of thousands. That eat meat. And the best bodybuilders in the world eat meat. Let's talk about the false dichotomy where they claim that uh, carbohydrate consumption is better for building muscle. Yeah, they try to weave this narrative into the film that high carb diets are vegan and you can't be high carb if you're not vegan. Now they never say this, but that's kind of the message. That's yeah. Portrayed. They're really pushing just there's all or nothing. Yeah. So they pick out this study. They say this study showed that a normal carb group built more muscle than a low carb group and resistance trained athletes. I know the study very well. I didn't even need to look it up. So this study was comparing a high protein ketogenic diet 
versus a high protein non ketogenic diet. Now, a ketogenic diet is very low in carbohydrates. Both groups were eating animal protein. Both groups were getting two grams of protein per kilo of body weight. Which is pretty high. Pretty high, yeah.、Mm-hmm. But again, both groups eating animal products. They didn't say this. The way they weave the narrative makes it seem like, oh, they're comparing a vegan diet to a non vegan diet again. No, they were comparing very low carb to normal carbohydrate. So again, they don't show you everything. They cite the research, but they just pick the parts of it they want. So the filmmakers also heavily go after、uh, the meat and dairy industry for funding a lot of the scientific research、um, that looks at animal proteins and vegan proteins. But what they fail to do is include their own biases and their own. Help me out here. Conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest, yeah. So, yeah, they don't include their own conflicts of interest, which, listen, on a scientific paper, you have to include the funding source and your conflicts of interest on the very first page. They made it seem like it was hidden, tucked away somewhere. No, it's right no, there. No, it's right there for everyone <laughs> to see. And it still has to go through peer review. And. A lot of the studies that we're going to cite and put in the description weren't even funded by、uh, dairy or meat industries. But even so, criticizing funding sources without disclosing your own conflicts of interest is extremely disingenuous. The producer of the film, James Cameron, owns a pea protein company. Arnold owns a supplement company called Ladder, which makes vegan products. Not all of them are vegan, but he does sell some. And then nearly every expert and person in the film makes money from selling either vegan books or vegan products. Those are huge conflicts of interest that are never disclosed.、Mm-hmm. And they fail to actually interview anybody that is、um, an opposing view. Yeah. So if you're, if you're going to go after people for conflicts of interest, what's the saying? Don't throw stones when you live in a glass house. <laughs> exactly. Now, then they switch gears and they kind of go with the save the planet、uh, narrative, which honestly, if there's one narrative that I think is most compelling, other than the ethical reasons for not eating animals, it's probably this.、Mm-hmm. Now,、um, meat,、uh, farmland takes up a lot more area, uses a lot more water. Than a lot of other forms of agriculture.、Mm-hmm. So, those are valid criticisms, and we'll acknowledge those where they are. Yeah. But. So, in the film, they actually claim that the emissions produced from meat production and animal production、uh, is greater than all transport production combined. Yeah, and that's just a blatant lie.、Mm-hmm. So, transportation accounts for about 27% of the world's emissions, meat production、Something、is、like、8.7%, eight. Eight. Yeah. and electricity is over 30%. So, you want to cut meat out from your diet? Okay. But if you're admonishing people and you drive a muscle car or you know, own a, you know, several、uh, computers and smartphones or whatever, I mean, it's, it's kind of、uh, disingenuous.、Mm-hmm. So,、um, yes, things could be improved a little bit, but we still need to figure out our problems with emissions from transportation and electricity、First. if we really want to help the planet. All right. We left out a lot of stuff, but quite frankly, we just didn't have the time to put everything in. Yeah, I feel like there are about four more pages of、uh, oh、things、God. that we actually wrote down when we watched this film. So, overall, what's your take? I, I'm a little disappointed, to be honest. I think they really, really tried to push veganism onto everybody and make it a fix for everything, and it's just not the case.、Yeah. Um, I also don't like that you know, it was an unfair argument. When you bring a you know, statement to the table or you have a hypothesis, you want to look at both sides of the, you know, the evidence and you know, come up with a conclusion. And they really just pitched one side.、So. Yeah. They cherry picked, they created false dichotomies, straw men. They kind, of, they kind of went down a list of logical fallacies and checked them all off. I was also really disappointed. I can't say I'm surprised. Every food mockumentary I've seen has been like this.、Uh, it makes me really angry. Because it just contributes to the overall confusion for the average person. I'm a little disappointed in Arnold, actually, to be honest. Yeah, a guy who built his career eating meat,、yeah. and all of a sudden, but now he's like, oh, but I feel so much better now. Yeah, it's just extremely disingenuous, disappointing. If you want to be vegan for ethical reasons, yeah, hey,、fine. you have our blessing, awesome, good on you. 
you can also be vegan and become an elite athlete. Mm -hmm. You probably need to pay a little bit more close attention to your protein intake and your amino acid intake, but it can be done. Yeah. But trying to push this as a solution for everything, as a cure for everything, is extremely disingenuous. It's not scientifically accurate, and it just further confuses people mm -hmm. who last week read something about how carbs were the were the were the problem with everything. Yeah. So there's absolutely no reason why a meat eater can't also eat a bunch of vegetables and plants either. exactly like there's a thing called balanced you know exactly so overall this thing was a steaming pile of shit it does not help anyone it doesn't help vegans um and the scientists who i see defending it it makes you look like a joke uh, we're going to put all the links to all the research we cited in the description so you guys can go check it out There's for yourself. The written form as well, if you would like to go back and read any of it. Yeah, we're going to have an article up on my site as well, uh, talking about the full breakdown of this. So you guys can read it, read the studies, decide for yourself. As for me, I'm going to go take a bite of a nice lean hamburger. I might join you. <laughs> and we can attest out that erection theory. What do you say, babe? <laughs>